So I'm um, very, very enthused to hear uh, our main speaker tonight. I uh, first contacted Daniel, oh, must be a year and a half or so ago, and I was trying to get him to come to D.C. to do a talk for us, and he's based out of uh, the West Coast, out of Seattle area. So just the logistics of making that come together, where we just were overcome by events and and we're never able to uh, to pull that off. Uh, I guess if there's anything positive about this uh, COVID pandemic, it has made my life and my job so much easier. So now we can have presentations from Zachary in Thailand and Daniel in Seattle, and we can hear all these wonderful mushroom speakers. And uh, and uh, even though I I haven't yet heard Daniel speak. I've heard nothing but glowing reports about uh, what a wonderful mushroom speaker he is. Daniel owns and operates a business called Mushrooming, and uh, he's going to tell us more about that because my four-year-old niece is, uh, is uh, interested in mushrooms herself right now, so I'm just going to hand it off to Daniel. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everybody, for uh being here. It's uh, the possibility to share that online is quite intriguing, though I would have been much rather with all of you in Washington DC, especially when I hear that your mushrooms are popping like crazy. Um, I was already considered, oh, maybe, maybe I should come over there. It never works that way, but um, we still have quite a dry summer here in the Pacific Northwest and enjoy our summer. The rains will come soon enough. Um, well, that's all hard to follow the mushroom ID and sex. Awesome presentation from Thailand. And you will see there's some overlaps. So um, the best of mushrooming is just basically the mushrooms that excited me most, uh, or some of them, there's just so many mushrooms out there I love to share with you. And I will start out with some stink horns. Um, what a fascinating organism these stink horns are and just so extraterrestrial looking. And um, actually we assume that all the eggs are edible. And I've tasted a few of them and um, a little bit more on that. This is here, Asaroi rubra. That was the first mushroom that was described in Australia. And I encountered it during a family vacation in Hawaii. So um, there's not such a great fungal diversity in Hawaii. There's a good book about it, Dennis Desjardins, as mentioned by Sec before, he was also part of that. And um, so if you ever end up in Hawaii, uh, check out uh, your timing so you catch some of the, the rain. Here's Stinkhorn I came across on the Caribbean coast in Colombia. Um, pretty frigid water when we were there in September a couple of years ago. And I found this Clathris and I don't think it's a described species yet. The way uh, how the the head is uh, interconnected there and how the gleba, the um, spore mass is attached. I have not found any matches and um, we didn't take a sample. Um, they're very, uh, a lot of the Andean countries are very opposed to anybody taking mushrooms unless you have a university cooperation um, and even uh, for people in Colombia doing research where absurd regulations uh, for mushroom collection and uh, very little mushroom eating also there. Um, and this was, uh, the previous one was in a national park, so we didn't take anything out in the first place. Uh, Laternia dringii uh, dring was a, a mycologist specialized on stink horns, and this is a tiny stink horn. Um, still being quite pungent and growing in late stage decaying wood here, um, maybe not taller than two inches. And many of these stink horns, interestingly, fruit in all directions. So a lot of mushrooms will make sure that 
their fruiting bodies point upwards. They align themselves with the uh, magnetic field of the Earth, as you can very nicely see with the Amanitas, who will correct their stem. Um, if you lay them down, they will bend their stem so that the caps are actually horizontally aligned. Uh, and then you never can straighten them out again. But these stinkhorns, they just go in whatever direction the egg points, uh, because uh, it's about the insects that come, or the animals that come and spread the gleba, the spores. Now, this is a, a, a stinkhorn that is, let's say, arrested in the egg stage. So it never grew a fruiting body, or it, there is no fruiting body really above ground. It's in the top layer of the, um, of the soil. And now this one here smells like passion fruit, maracuya, really fruity odor. And it's not hoping for some flies that are attracted to really weird, stinky odors we naturally have uh, disdain for. No, this is a really fruity odor and it's attracting deer and other mammals to spread their spores. Protubera is the genus and the first protuber actually that was described is called maracuya, which is Spanish for the passion fruit, one of the I think one of the best fruits when it comes to richness of taste uh, we have. Um, here, what I call the cross-dressing stinkhorn, Phallus induciatus, um, quite common all over the tropics. There's ranges in color, that's different uh, species then. And interestingly here in the Bolivian Amazon, they will only fruit at night and Usually you got to have a very good rain at least uh, a day before. So if it's a dry day and a dry night before, they're not going to happen. They react to uh, thunderstorms. In many cultures, there's a reference to lightning and mushrooms. And, um, but, uh, you know, when you just have a dry night and a dry day, then um, we don't see them popping. And often we smell them before we see them because it's out in the dark. So it's quite a thing. You know, when you use these jungle lodges, they usually have walkways through the jungle. So you're not right out there in hostile environment, but you stay on path, not the mushroom hunters. Uh, that's a different story, but we always try to know where the path is. But then we smell these things and sometimes we find them right away. Other times we look half an hour in the dark and step carefully around because all the critters come out at nights, including snakes and whatever. And, um, and then sometimes we don't find them. And then the next morning you find them um, flaccid on the ground. So it's only a party for a night and all kinds of creatures are attracted. On the left, you have a stinkhorn, uh, where I use the UV light and I can only recommend you get yourself a good UV light when you go in the tropics. Um, the lichens will turn into all incredible colors, blue, orange, yellow. Um, so for if you have a little interest in lichens or good colors, um, look that up and you need, uh, not every UV light works. Uh, it's only, I think, between 360 and 380 nanometers. But for a white mushroom, everything will pop like this. And on the lower right, you see a moth that is feasting on the uh, stinky gleba and spreading the spores as intended. In, that's the old name, hey, Dictyophora. It's back to Phallus. Um, DNA puts it right back with all the other fallus like stinkhorns. And in China, it's a desired edible. And here on the market in Kunming, one of the biggest mushroom markets in the world, not very far from uh, Thailand. Um, what a happening mushroom culture there in Southeast Asia, just incredible. And here the people, uh, take the stink horns, some of them are farmed, others are collected in the wild, and you take off the, the egg on the bottom and the top, the stinky top, these are discarded and what's kept is the stem and the whale. 
and that's then used in, in soups or so. It doesn't have much taste by itself, but it, it will absorb every taste um, you'll find in a soup. And then, you know, uh, Chinese cuisine is very tactile about the foods in the mouth. So jelly-like stuff, whatever different consistencies really appreciate it. Much more adventurous than our Western cuisine where, oh, this is slimy, this is this, you know. No, no, oh, this is slimy, how interesting, you know. Um, of course, taste is an important factor, but the repertoire of consistencies is so much more appreciated. And um, so interesting, uh, stink horns. Now this stink horn here I came across in Suriname, which is a tiny country of the, used to be Dutch Guyana. So the Guyanas are better known, one of the um, South American countries that are not part of Latin America because um, they speak Dutch, English or French. And there is these tiny stink horns, also in Brazil you would find them, Solophallus, Sologenus. Um, I know there's all kinds of jokes in, in, in American English about wood and phallus and so on, so I'm not going to go there. But they're so tiny, and before you see them, you smell these guys. Uh, see my fat thumb in comparison to the size of that stink horn. And um, on the right side, how they grow in a little... Um, in a little group right next to Fallacia, which is a tiny member of the Solaria family. So something, you got to look very closely to find it and you might smell it before you see it because um, very pungent, but tiny and fragile. Now this guy is, um, is its proper eight inches and um, so far, uh, reported usually from uh, Argentina, Uruguay, Sandy areas. So um, a Brazilian stinkhorn expert lady was quite surprised that we found it in Bolivia, but it's a, a good match to Camponalatus, uh, Campona which is like, you know, a bell shape, um, very phallic um, thing, but their mother nature uh, has another version um, and definitely not going with the male aspect of these stink horns, Laternia pusilla. Um, so before some of you start uh, uh, laughing here, pusilla, please know your Latin. Pusilla means tiny. So it comes from puer, the little boy, and pusilla is going even smaller than the little boy. Um, I don't know if the mycologist uh, who described that was uh, going here for the double entendre. Um, on the right side, the version I found, and I've been looking for it in that one place in Colombia. I've been in that forest uh, three, four times, and every time I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it, so because I always found it um, in, a, in a rotten stage. So then once I found it, but it already had uh, ripped on the top. On the left side, you have the photo from Juliana Furzi, uh, quite a force in mycology down in Chile. And then your follows Impudicus, um, translated as the shameless penis. And actually, uh, I think Linné called all the morels, um, they were also in the beginning part of phallus. And this is here in Bhutan, where they are very common, Bhutan, the Himalayan kingdom, where they are very common in pine forests. Uh, it took me a while till I figured that out. You see the different stages, um, the egg stage with the jelly around, and then um, offering the, the stinky gleba on the left, where the flies will come. And then on the right, in the center, uh, pretty much cleaned off by the insects. And, uh, my Bhutanese uh, guide and friend who got totally hooked on mushrooms after two mushrooming tours there, he kept taking it down to the village and you could see how it was growing in the half hour from where we picked it to when we arrived in the village. It's just amazing this process of these stink horns uh, erupting out of the eggs. Okay, let's see if we can do that. That is Removing the slime or the jelly layer. Well, the jelly layer does the taste offensive. It has basically no taste. And see how we peel that off. Comes off right 
Father Mary, Mary, and the Libra is so very firm, not sleepy at all. And then we take it out. And then hmm. like a very mild horse rider. Firm. Not spicy. Um, let's see if we separate this. I have to figure out where, where the spiciness is. Oh yeah, the spiciness is here in the Gleba. Um, there's a little bit of jelly in the sink center I don't care for. This thing might have been very close, ready to go. Daniel, the quality of that video is uh, too uh, difficult to follow. It's very okay. dry. No problem. You can't hear it. Okay, so um, should have, I should have tested it with you guys. So here yeah, I'm sitting in, in a pine forest. You see a couple of rhododendrons and so on in, in Bhutan and was saying basically the spiciness of the stinkhorn is in the gleba, is in the, um, in the spore layer. And in this stage, the gleba only turns stinky when it is oxidized. So before, if it's not exposed to the air, it's not stinky. And of course, once it is exposed to the air and you can get notes between uh, rotten meat and feces, you know, it's like you want to stay away as far as you can. Um, so anyways, interestingly, the stinkhorn also has a medicinal tradition. Um, in Europe, it was used for sore limbs, gout, rheumatism, um, in powders and ointments, um, also traditionally in Europe against uh, cancers and epilepsy. And there is some uh, modern studies too, uh, where it shows it enhances immune system, anti-inflammatory and in vitro anti-tumor activity as many, many mushrooms. So this is here, um, uh, the information I have in my uh, little uh, fold out medicinal mushrooms of North America I co-produced with uh, Robert Rogers and Robert Rogers is the, the medicinal mushroom man and um, I did more the descriptions but I had no I wasn't aware there was a medicinal aspect here to to the stinkhorns uh, they still fascinated me and then here in the pine forest in Bhutan we came across this thing and it's like what are we looking here at and it reminded me of the fool's cordyceps podostroma. So some of you might have found growing out of wood something that looks like a cordyceps and you're trying to find that insect and there is no insect. It's a wood decayer closely related to cordyceps and it's a parasite on this phallus impudicus and so far, there was only a report from Japan and the beauty of the internet, I Google Podostroma and Follis and I find the one paper that discusses this, or I found a secondary paper that discusses this whole thing and where they saying, oh, we don't, we are not sure if this is actually a Podostroma, it could be the anamorph of a Follis impudicus. But I, I think, you know, the Japanese uh, mycologists who describe that in the first place uh, are right on target with a podostroma. It's, it's just the firmness. And um, the mycologists in Bhutan I have, I'm working with have never noticed it. And I'll found, I found it now in two or three places there in the, in the pine forests. Another very weird thing in Bhutan, and maybe some of you have heard about these squamanitas, which um, puzzled uh, the mycological community for many years because it's a parasitic mushroom that uh, takes over another mushroom and then will grow on top of the stem of another mushroom. So the lower part is the parasitized mushroom and the upper one is the squamanita. Um, I'm not 100% sure which squamanita I have and um, I left these things in Bhutan and they don't have DNA capacity and so on, but they're also very protective and um, going there, not without an academic cooperation, uh, once again, the same issues. Um, 
here a couple slime molds. So I got uh, in recent years into photo stacking, which you can do these amazing things. Unfortunately, it's uh, painstakingly slow when you work with 40 or 50 pictures and the software just is not as good as when you really do a lot of things by hand. So this picture might have taken me um, 20 minutes to clean up and work with and make uh, sure I see everything. So this um, Ceratum, Ceratum mixer, which Fruticulosa, it's all around the world. And um, anybody who looks for little things will probably run into a form of Ceratum mixer. Um, how tall would that be? You know, maybe anywhere from, from two to five millimeters. Uh, looks like a frozen forest. I'm just in love with these, these little things. Um, Spherosperma, glass-like stems. I mean, stipes, just so amazing. Uh, you know, this is uh, before photo stacking. And then you might have seen the pretzel slime mold. Um, I came only across once in, in Suriname, one of the famous slime molds. And then this, this beautiful green Fusarella oblonga parasitizing, well, maybe not parasitizing, but fruiting on a, on a conch. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, it's like, what is this? What is this? The diversity of slime molds is just so amazing. They're not related. Uh, they're not part of the kingdom of fungi. Uh, they're their own thing, but um, I leave it at this. Now, also here in Bhutan, I ran into this... Um, into this uh, jelly fungus. We've seen before uh, Dacryomyces and this, I have no idea if it is actually, uh, the species is correct of this Ditiola. And that was big. This was at least three, four inches, three inches long, some of these things. Um, very impressive and um, curious what it is. And then there is a little uh, Exidia jelly fungus in Bhutan, Sushing Shamo. Uh, Sushing is rosewood, and it only grows on roses. And it's these little um, brownish uh, jelly drops, and it has a high market values. The Chinese are into that as a medicinal. So people go from rose bush to rose bush, look for the dead branches, and pick these things. And it has a a pound price, uh, several hundred dollars, but dry jelly fungus. So, um, you know, it's not like one of these guys would be a dollar or so, but, um, but it's pretty easy, you know, to recognize a rose bush. Of course, it's a whole different story navigating within a rose bush, hunting for the dead branches. So, um, uh, you know, usually that has its price if you're not extremely careful. Um, that was two years ago, was the year of blue mushrooms. I visited my daughter who was doing a semester in uh, New Zealand and Entoloma hochstetteri uh, is actually the only mushroom that made it on a banknote. And it's not the $5 New Zealand dollar note. No, it is actually, I think the $50 note. You find this beautiful blue mushroom that people also like to report from South America. So it's a Southern Hemisphere distribution. Not sure if it's exactly the same thing, if anybody did DNA for the South American and the Indian version. But India and South America, um, uh, India, Australia, um, and Madagascar were connected in some point, so who knows. Um, anyways, a Leptonias, we do have blue Leptonias out here in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm sure you have some of them out on the East Coast. Um, that's often the bluest we get. Um, so always, uh, you know, I'm just so excited when I find great color. And then, of course, you are very familiar with Lactarius indigo. I just learned in Asia, it is sub indigo. This is in Bhutan and the Bhutanese were not aware that this is an ed edible mushroom. And um, what a gorgeous mushroom. Unfortunately, we do not have it on the East Coast at all. Um, I never saw it on the East Coast. I only found it in, in Colombia and in Bhutan. Um, 
Never expected it. I think the only place somewhere out west is in, um, in Arizona. They have a population of uh, uh, Lactarius indigo. And then the bluet, um, here in a quite purple version, um, it's, I'm not sure if it's Clytosibin nuda, probably if people, if DNA is done on these things, we might have a whole bunch of different populations, but um, I do identify my bluets when I wanna eat them by the frozen orange juice-like aroma, very fruity aroma, easy to identify for most people. Some people don't smell it, the fruitiness, but most people do. And then I am, uh, I'm sure that it is uh, an edible bluet and I enjoy frying them up. We can buy them now in the store for about $35. Um, then they are imported from England where somebody figured out to cultivate them. But, you know, um, I wouldn't spend $35 on a pound of bluets. Uh, they're quite abundant here in November. Uh, late season mushroom, have them in my yard, so um, not hurting for enjoying my bluets. And then a couple more bluish toned ones on the lower left uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. Last year was one of these awesome mushroom years, as mentioned, every seven years. The last one was 2013, so there is really something into it. Um, I think part of a really important factor for having an awesome mushroom year especially regarding ectomycorrhizals, is also from European research the previous years, because the trees must be in a generous mood. If the trees are not, um, were stressed in a previous year or in the summer, for us here, we had a year where we had 10 inches in October, which is a lot, even for the Pacific Northwest here, the Seattle areas, and the mushrooms weren't great because the summer was so high, hot, and the trees were stressed. So for the ectomycorrhizal mushrooms, you always have to take into account uh, the state of affairs for the trees, which provide the sugar for the fruiting of the mushrooms. And this, um, uh, the little paler mushroom here, this is the Bhutanese version of something close to Clytosibi odora, same intense order, um, quite common there. Um, this is a small to mid-size Amanita in the Himalayas, Rubro volvata, and I was just so blown away by these little primordia, these little buds, um, you know, how they show up, and already there's all the color, and the color of the cap and uh, the bulbous base are still together, and then you see in the growing, in the stretching factor, uh, um, how you know you you have the red all separated and then a little bit red here left on the ring. This is a poisonous mushroom, um, quite common, and um, but uh, people stay away. Now here, this is Amanita hemibafa, which was first described and Sack also shared with us uh, some from uh, Thailand, and um, hemibafa was first described. Uh, in the 1860s, uh, one of the hookah um, expeditions, anybody into botany might have heard about uh, the hookah father and son that did uh, their botanical research in the Himalayas. And they also brought uh, mushrooms back from their expeditions here. They found it in Sikkim and it was identified. And then the name was actually used for quite a while in the Southwest, in the American Southwest for the, the Caesar version which now is a Jacksonii and apparently doesn't uh, taste anything close to this mushroom. This is a sweet, nutty mushroom, great consistency. Um, I think everybody who ate them is in love with them. After you are through the phase of checking in with your kidney and your liver because you've been conditioned that Amanitas uh, will cause organ failure, uh, once you made it through that part um, and you're not worried anymore, um, it's really amazing and it's easy to identify. It has this big patch when young. It has yellow gills, a yellow stem, no ring. Um, so striations on the cap. Uh, so I, I'd say it's a safe mushroom and the main problem is, is mentally, um, not, not identification. And here the uh, lady uh, Sonam, her name, uh, we 
introduced her to the mushrooms and we were hoping to eat these mushrooms, but uh, no, she didn't share them with the group. She um, cooked them with the drivers and, and the local people she hung out with and we found some others, but you know, it's really, it's a great mushroom and look at the size. Another Amanita we found in Bhutan, um, which looked so much like Augusta and um, Augusta is what used to be Franchetti Eye in Europe. Um, here's a Californian version of it. It is now uh, recognized as edible um, because it is not uh, related closely to Franchetti Eye, Amanita Franchetti Eye, a European toxic Amanita version. Um, but uh, it doesn't have in taste or structure what it has in beauty, pretty lame tasting mushroom. So, I think I'm done after three or four times trying to eat it after David Aurora uh, uh, experimented with edibility after he figured out where it's in the system. And you know, the Adash, there is no old bold mushroom eaters. Um, I don't like that. I think that the point is you gotta be informed and educated. And yes, when I try doubtful things, I always like to do that with people who've eaten it before like Amanita Vaginata, where um, Sack talked about. But, um, you know, you just don't be stupid and eat something you have no idea. But when, when, I've contact, when I've had three or four people telling me this mushroom is edible, I will try it. Uh, I'm not gonna be the first one. I'm, I have family, I love life, and, um, you know, I'm not gonna experiment on that level. But, um, I think it's awesome that people do that and, and, you know, are sometimes outrageous and I hope they really make sure they know what they're doing. And this is an interesting example here. What you're looking at is the cap of a type of porcini. So in Bhutan, they would tell you that no bold mushroom eater, uh, no smart mushroom eater is going to eat this porcini. Traditionally, this is a poisonous mushroom and the people are out in the woods collecting matsutake for the Japanese market. They're collecting all kinds of corals and uh, uh, fried chicken mushroom, lyophyllum, and um, what else? Uh, Russula and, and um, anyway, it's a whole bunch of mushrooms. They have a great knowledge of mushrooms, but when it comes to this uh, crack cap bullet, Oh no, it's poisonous. And I've ran into that already 10 years earlier in, in Tibet where people told me this is a poisonous mushroom. And the culture in Bhutan and Tibet is very connected. I mean, Bhutanese are strongly influenced by Tibetan culture. They're part of the cul Tibetan cultural sphere, but they always try to tell how different they are so that the Chinese don't come and say, hey, what, you're Tibetan? Oh, you're ours, right? Um, no, it's so nice to have uh, Tibetan Buddhist culture and Tibetan culture without uh, under the Chinese heel. Um, I went through that year after year after year and I come and I go, but it's, it's so tough to see uh, what's going on in Tibet and how the people are, uh, are being abused there and then coming to Bhutan where that is not an issue at all. So here we were picking um, these uh, porcinis under spruce trees and that was part of a project I was doing with uh, Bhutan Network um, and um, we taught the people these are edible mushrooms and that was last year and this year where we were I was supposed to be there still in Bhutan today last day of the tour um, but of course we had to cancel it um, now people starting eating this locally so they're writing on Facebook oh man that mushroom is great we had no idea we kicked it for years we thought it's poisonous this is much better than Matsutake. Who would, you know, because the Matsutake, they weren't in love with them before. The Japanese want them. And there's an attitude about the taste of Matsutake with many mushroom hunters in Bhutan. But now they're discovering these porcini. And I was uh, so lucky to be part, uh, you know, of, of telling people, hey, you have a choice edible out here. Uh, down there is one more. Um, with she was doing processing all kinds of things and part of the mushrooming tour we we um sponsored uh dryer which is not um 
which is a different one. But anyway, so I did uh, mushroom presentations for schools. I thought I gonna be in front of a 10th grade class with 15 people and there was 400 students when I showed up. So that was a little uh, surprising. And, but you know, the Bhutanese love their mushrooms, then the caterpillar fungus, cordyceps is a big deal, Yartsa Gumbu, everybody knows about it, but the benefits is only for the mountain people, not here, we are in the subtropics, um, government school here, they know how important education is and the government is not holding back in financing education. And can you believe it? Free healthcare in Bhutan. I mean, every other civilized country has a version that people have access to healthcare. But a country like Bhutan, which is like when it comes to wealth number 140 in the world, free healthcare for the citizens. Yeah, I know we can't get there, but Bhutan can. I'm back to the mushrooms. Um, and you know, free healthcare is a really nice thing when you experiment with mushrooms. At least you only have to worry about yourself and not your finances. Um, but different story. So here people also enjoy this Bandasavia, Montana they call it. Um, so the younger the better, but I also found it on the market. It was a little spicy, but it was enjoyable. I had no idea. Uh, some of you might eat on the East Coast, some of the Bondasavia, I don't know. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, impressive mushroom and also enjoyed. Hygnellum pecchia is something I find out here. So I am not sure if it's exactly the same species, but you know, this, um, what's it called? Strawberry and cream. Um, uh, also out there in the spruce forest, the same forest as the, the, the bolides, the king bolides, the pochinia, all associated um, with uh, spruce trees, at least the one species I showed you, the reticulous saps. And then I came across uh, this bolide, which uh, the previous presentations I saw as, uh, as probably undescribed, but it was described in 2016 in Japan, back then as Bolides carmesinius, Carmesine is, is, is a, the red color you see here. Probably it would be now a exudoporus or botrybolides. It's closely related to what you guys have, the frosty eye, uh, what used to be bolides frosty eye. So no idea about edibility, but what a beautiful, um, impressive bolide. Also a spruce associated. We're talking about 3,400 meters, so 11,000, 12,000 feet, which is a high mountain subalpine forest. So below, still, still a distance below tree line. Um, much lower in the oak, um, oak hemlock forest, this uh, Boletellus, I could not find a name yet, though pretty unique, you know, with the greenish cap and, and this very um, reticulate stem and the pinkish hymenium when young, so. Um, I gotta see, probably the easiest for me, India has very little um, mycology. In, 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 in Nepal, there is, some, uh, there is some good research going on now, um, but um, probably a lot of the flora, fauna and funga in the Himalayan, in the, uh, in the Himalayas are connected uh, to China and Japanese when it comes to funga and flora. So, um, that's uh, the easier place to check. And then um, Sek also mentioned the termitomyces, the Tsongka, Bhutanese name is Bangmu, termite mushroom. Uh, this was in a very shady spot in the forest. And um, uh, there is about, I think 30 species and it's really hard. Uh, I had not much luck trying to key out what I have. Um, but here, uh, Termitomyces I found in Sichuan, um, in, the, in the rice bowl of Sichuan near Chengdu. And you see this extended uh, stem base that then goes down into the nest of the termites. So there is no Termitomyces in the new world. Um, it's an old world phenomena, Asia, Africa, and it will fruit in, well, basically in the ant poop. So the ants chew up the wood as termites do, and then they will poop out the, the, um, the wood um, 
maybe it was just chewed up. Um, actually, yes, I think it's, that's the leaf cutter just chew up their stuff and feed it to the mushrooms. So I don't know that little detail, but the mushroom will root in this, in this pre-digested or digested wood debris and very firm, very Swedish taste. So really an amazing mushroom and wherever it grows, people know it. And, you know, in India, people are not in love with mushrooms in many places. They're quite fungophobe. Um, and this whole story about Soma, the religious, you know, and, and the mushroom magic of India and Soma, I have doubts. Otherwise, if that was the case, I would think that the country would be in love with mushrooms. Anyways, this is not my picture, but this is the biggest of all um, termitomyces in Africa. Um, and uh, people love it there too. They cut it into stripes, uh, um, dry it, sell it on the roads. So everybody knows um, this is an awesome mushroom. And it's, it's not just here, the people who are into the doors of perception. Um, back in Bhutan, one of their main mushrooms everybody enjoys is uh, Sese Shamu, the chanterelle. Sese is the oak tree and mostly associated with oaks. Um, it is assumed that it is uh, the European name Cantarellus Siberius is used, uh, but nobody did DNA yet. They actually had a cooperation with a uh, great Danish mycologist, um, Lasse and Peterson, who were working there. And the, the guy who was controlling the biodiversity protection office said, sorry, you cannot take anything out of the country for DNA studies, but they don't have the capacity for DNA studies. So Lasse and Peterson gave up in the second year and, and the Bhutanese, the handful of Bhutanese mycologies were completely heartbroken. They had top-notch people who worked all around the world and this idiot in the biodiversity department showed the power he had and stopped everything. So um, another chanterelle I found um, uh, in a, in a uh, there was uh, hemlocks, big hemlocks around. Uh, there's a uh, Tsuga Dumosa in the Himalayas and um, no idea what it is, but it is probably in the section Amethystini. This morning I, I went into that and where we have in the US, Louisiana and Percy Sinus uh, and uh, they a little scaly on the cap, darker top and um, left them with the Bhutanese Mushroom Center, but who knows if anybody's ever gonna work on it there. Never seen this thing before, a little craterellus. Um, when going to the Tibetan areas, um, I always would hit down in lowland China's the bookstores and look for mushroom books. And there's many of them published in China. Most of them, as Zach mentioned for Thailand, also full of European and American names because that's easily accessible, but um, that has changed now. Uh, people realize that they really can't just copy from each other and from uh, Western publications. No idea about edibility or anything, but just what a little beauty. And here making a jump. Um, so this is in the rainforest in Suriname again. And I was uh, supposed to be this year again in June, but Corona hit. And two years, previous two years in June, I always went there for three weeks and went with Amazonas, Amazon conservation team, which are actually in DC based, do great work in Suriname and Colombia and uh, Brazil, um, helping indigenous people. And um, Mark Plotkin started that and he, he uh, is interested in helping people uh, with food security and keeping the knowledge alive about their mushrooms. So these are chanterelles. This is the only time I found chanterelles, you know, walking miles and miles in the rainforest. Um, they only show up in these, in very few spots around very limited trees, and then they fruit like by the hundred. And um, 
So the, the local name was something like Urs Mushroom or so, which I'm not so sure about if this was the traditional name. It has the same fragrant um, apricot odor and um, we fried them up and shared them with the people and they all loved it. And um, so this is here the Tepu uh, in the village, we took them back and um, here the, some of the, in the, in the blue t-shirts, the local uh, indigenous people, um, Bazajan and Tisinase, who, who, which was, took us to the spot. They did, they weren't aware the mushrooms are there, but it was right next to where they're gonna cut the forest for their fields. So now they know about the value and they know how good these mushrooms are. Um, and right there next to the spot in a tree sent this beautiful uh, dying poison dart frog, which people actually come to this part of Suriname right on the Brazilian border uh, just to see that mushroom. Uh, sorry, not that mushroom. That's just my mind. Uh, that, that frog, just incredible. Um, hung out there on a tree. And common in the Amazon is this uh, red marasmus that has this gorgeous structure. And this is here again, uh, photo stacking where you just get every part of the mushroom in focus. Um, I know there's a school who likes these things dissolving into out of focus areas and cloudy and whatever, but I just love the structure of mushrooms and bring that out. And then with Photoshop, you know, when you work with the light too and, 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 and sharpening, it's just amazing what you can do. And, and you can see the mushrooms in a way which you can't even focus with your own eyes. Um, so I'm really taken by this uh, technique and it's a total killer in, in, in regard of time management. Tetrapyrgos nigripes, uh, very common. It's a species group of uh, close to marasmus and it always has these grayish, bluish uh, stems and probably there's five species under that name or 10 or so. Um, doesn't hurt me when, when I can't resolve the last riddles of taxonomy. If I have a label that is close enough, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. And yes, I wish to, but um, there's only that much time in a day. Um, Geronima, uh, Sciusiforme, beautiful uh, wood decayer. And when you look on the lower right side of that picture, there was this spirit mushroom. I'm not even aware I saw it when I took the picture. I don't know, um, but you know, it has maybe three, four inches diameter the cap and then there's this primordia there just ready to go at some point. And you might recognize that one. You just looked at a picture, Mitch, right? Pseudohydnum. I had no idea. I know it here out of the conifer forest, cat's tongue. We, we, uh, um, we roll them in sugar and dry them out. You can make a little candy out of it. And they're in the rainforest, no conifer, left or right. And I was just so blown away and um, photo stacking again here. And the first attempt I took, the back was all out of focus and I had it already on the dryer, which was a little gasoline burner in a canvas, a uh, little apparatus tent to dry these things. And then I look at the picture, Oh no! And then I got it back out of the dryer. It didn't do any damage yet and could do the picture. So found it twice and yeah, one got to do DNA on these things. So in the rainforest, not so many people, there's exceptions, but most uh, Amazon people are not uh, great mycophagists. They don't know about so many edible mushrooms, but the wood ears are generally a mushroom people know about and um, they are eaten, then um, yeah, this uh, Auricularia delicata, uh, that's uh, widely distributed and there's probably a bunch of species under this name, easy to identify, always on wood. Uh, that was the last time I, I, I cut my hair at some point. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I ran into this Auricularia, which, 
Oh, yeah, that's the old name, uh, polytrichia. I think now it's something with nigrescence or so. The, all the New World ones have changed their name. Um, so it had these incredible conical heads on there, the, the hyphal protrusions. Um, that's in the oak forest in Colombia again. And then um, in, the, in the tropics and subtropics, we frequently run into this pink oyster mushroom that um, can be also very white, goes very pink when young, very pink, uh, good, tasty um, mushroom, not easy to be told apart from Pleurotus albidus. I'm in exchange with a Brazilian Pleurotus expert, Nelson, who is helping me a little bit, but um, it's really the oysters to tell the oysters uh, apart by uh, macromorphology uh, seems to be quite a challenge and you know it's, it really would take a DNA. I have all these mushrooms in Suriname in the state herbarium and they just don't react to my emails. Hey can we share them whatever. Um, it's, it's very frustrating. And then I ran into this mushroom and was all excited. I thought oh this could be a home buhalia and um, the horseshoe oyster and then when coming back and looking at the pictures, um, it turns out it's a trosia. And the trosia um, is a common tropical, subtropical wood decay, Asia, New World, but it has a very famous relative in Yunnan, Venenata, that supposedly killed 300 people in Yunnan. So whenever you read these statistics of 90% of the people or 80% are killed by Amanita, Phylloides group related mushrooms. Um, hello, I don't think you calculating the 300 people in southwest China that ate these little mushrooms that grow on wood and it is still not clear what the toxin is, but when you would eat these mushrooms, only a few, but I mean 300, but that was over 50 years or so, um, you would just keel over with a heart arrest. Um, so no bad suffering or anything, you're just dead. And once they figured that out in 2013 and publicized that, it stopped. People stopped eating that mushroom in Yunnan and nobody died anymore, at least as much as I know. So this really gave me the night sweats, realizing, ooh, we have a trosia that's somewhat close looking to an oyster. And then there's this Yunnan relative that is so deadly. And I actually, I should have it in talk. I made a poster um, for uh, Amazon conservation team with um, 20 edible mushrooms and, um, and have the oysters in there and the lantinas and wood ears and chanterelles and, um, you know, but uh, there's no reports of everybody getting any harm from Trojan in the new world. Uh, this is an easy to recognize common lantinus, concavus, gets pretty big. Um, wood decayer used to be Pleurotus concavus, but lantinus is a gilt polypore. Pleurotus, of course, is a, an, an agaric. Um, the stems are too tough to enjoy, but the caps are quite nice. You want to cook them for quite a while. And I cooked them up in Suriname on the expedition. There was, we were over 20 people who were mostly doing vegetation work and looking for edible nuts and honey and so on. And then I brought these home and um, uh, had cooked them for the team. The cook would refuse to cook them. Yeah, my grandma might have eaten mushrooms, but now nah, we don't really eat mushrooms. And mushrooms is for losers. You go in the forest and you come back with killed animal or fish, right? Not mushrooms. So uh, a, a sad attitude. Um, and so we're working on educating people, let them know that the fungal protein is, is basically as good as the meat protein and it's a great alternative. Um, and here Wuta, one of the uh, shamans of the group who, is, who knows every tree out in the forest, it's amazing. And he ate some of that and then in the morning he told me he had a dream and he was dreaming, he was talking to the ancestors and the ancestors told him he asked them about what about mushrooms and the ancestor that says mushrooms are medicine. So, I mean, you know, I think you can't get a better uh, appreciation after feeding mushrooms to 
people who lost somewhat their contact with the mushrooms by, you know, the local shaman. The rest is all uh, bapti uh, Baptists by now and, and really causes such a loss of, um, of culture, you know. Anyways, this is the guy here in this village in Tepu um, of the trio people who knows the mushrooms, but he is losing his mind. So he hardly can remember when I brought him edible mushrooms, his eye lit up. But when I asked him, there was, you know, it, it was just so sad. And he's the last guy who really knows. Heartbreaking, you know, and now everybody spends so much time singing hymns and praising the Lord and, and forgetting all that knowledge that was accumulated over millennia. I mean, what a, what a cultural uh, disaster, you know, but hey, salvation is at hand and um, can't there be salvation maybe and traditional knowledge, you know, it's just throwing out the kid with the top. It's just so foolish. Cucania salsipis, um, something, uh, these uh, tropical goblet, cup, jungle cup, I like to call it. People in Guyana and in Tepu, they knew this is an edible mushroom and they would eat these mushrooms. And they are really, um, you know, I've seen them each time you're in the rainforest, you run into these mushrooms and there's versions all over the world and the DNA is not, uh, the, the taxonomy is not so clear, but they turn out when you fry them up, they have a nice crunchy structure, a nice fungal taste. Uh, we put it on a salad and it was like the perfect uh, bacon substitute. Never would have expected uh, so much joy out of a um, omnipresent mushroom that is on the markets in Mexico. People know in some areas in, in South America as edible. Uh, maybe also Malaysia, but, um, you know, otherwise under the radar and hopefully that will be changing. Um, here, so on the bamboo, they grew these bamboo balls and they were maybe up to two inches in diameter, one inch, three inch, and some of them really purple. And um, you see a sliced version on the left. And on the right side, you see the sterile top and then there's the fertile button. And so um, I wrote a whole article about them in Fungi Magazine. So I can't uh, get into many details here, but a really interesting mushroom, um, first described by a German mycologist who worked uh, 130 years ago in Brazil and came up with sustainable forest management in Germany in the 1890s. Uh, 1900 and got totally dissed by all his colleagues who were into even aged forest, you know, this kind of biocide, no diversity forest. And he understood diversity is the health of the forest, way ahead of his time. Um, anyways, so he called them Ascopolyporus. It's a Ascomycete, it is related to the cordyceps and on the base which I never see that thing, but there was a little aphid and that little aphid drills a hole into the bamboo. And um, that little hole in the bamboo will supply the fungus with lots of nutrients. So what you see that fungus is not growing out of the nutrients in that tiny aphids like a lot of cordyceps do, but it's using the bamboo chews. And this mushroom is eaten by these, um, by Girldy's monkey, which is like a palm sized tiny monkey that up to in the dry season, up to 70% of its food intake is dried mushrooms or is mushrooms. There's no other, I think, creature known that eats so many mushrooms. And I calculated for myself, that would be about 3000 pounds of mushrooms a day. Not a day, sorry, 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 a year, 3,000 mushroom, 3,000 pounds a year, which really sounds painful and like constipation. I mean, but these guys, especially wood ears and these, uh, what I Christian bamboo balls, um, is their choice mushroom uh, in the dry season. Um, this is uh, my twin brother, and this is actually the first mushroom I really liked as an edible mushroom was the, the, the parasol, 
which we don't have out here in, on, in the Pacific Northwest, but I grew up in Munich and, uh, and spent a lot of time in the Alps. And there you find these beautiful, huge parasols, such a nice meaty taste. And actually I was six or seven years old when I talked people into eating them when I was visiting with a friend. Um, so I hope they double checked on me, but I told them when we were on a forest outing, hey, let's pick this mushroom and cook it. I didn't care for the chanterelles and the porcini my parents loved and picked, and I loved picking them, but they were too mushy. And here you have a beautiful uh, parasol in uh, Colombia. So hardly anybody knows in Colombia, this is an edible mushroom. You find it uh, on the edges of forest and pastures uh, in the subalpine areas, quite common, typical drumsticks, snake skin, the snake skin stem is really helpful for identifying these macro lepiota, um, the parasols. You gotta be very careful with a lot of these lepiota-like big mushrooms. There is all kinds of uh, toxic stuff. So you gotta know what you're doing eating uh, uh, lepiota-like mushrooms. Uh, here, the, a picture in the Colombian oak forest, which doesn't look like any oak forest uh, we are used to with palms and gingers and um, oh, what's it called, the window plant and offices, this winding thing with lots of big foliage growing up here. There's some oak forests that look much more like our oak forests um, higher up, but the lower ones, and then you're in these tropical, seemingly tropical oak forests, uh, and there's chanterelles and there's lactarius and bolides, something you do not find in the Amazon. Only ectomycorrhizals are very rare in the Amazon. In the old world tropics, there's all kinds of ectomycorrhizals, but in the new world tropics, they're limited. There's real diversity in the highlands of Guyana, but in the Amazon itself, maybe on islands of white sand, there's more of them, but in general, you can go weeks and weeks and not seeing one ectomycorrhizals in the Bolivian Amazon, for example. But then with the oaks there, uh, higher up, you find also some blank tr black trumpets. And in the same forest, oak forest, these beautiful favelascias, a Mycena relative that gave up having gills and went to pores. Um, this is also in the subtropical level, lots and lots of um, psilocybe in the, on the cow pastures here. And I, I'm draw, I drew a blank here on the name, it's Cubensis, psilocybe Cubensis. So we stopped near pasture, I saw, saw a couple, oh, there gotta be mushrooms and there was like a hundred of them um, all over. Um, there is a community in Colombia who really appreciates that, but it's, it's still, um, uh, Colombians are not into eating mushrooms. Their oak forests are full of chanterelles and there's no commercial picking, there's no restaurants and so on. And um, so uh, we're working on changing that. Um, and I should, I should not go into it. There's so much media now about the benefits of medicinal uh, use of psychedelic mushrooms. And uh, my line is, I think the only crime really is that we are not using them for medicinal purposes. There's so much healing power. And, and finally, the mycological societies came around and, and don't shut people up talking about it. Um, uh, you know, it's part of the mushroom thing. It's, it's one of the beautiful white, white uh, subjects of of mycophilia, that we have these magic mushrooms that do amazing stuff and we really, it, it, it really should be used in a responsible way for healing as many of us have done it in um, not, uh, how shall we say that, in not, in not really formal settings, you know, but um, I first came to the US following the Grateful Dead around in the 80s and in, in that institutional context, of course, um, I was introduced and it wasn't false mushrooms as I was sold in, in, in Amsterdam or somewhere, you know. Anyways, um, back here to a favolaskia uh, and we turn off the light. And so there's some glowing favolaskias. They're closely related to mycenas, which have a lot of bioluminescent ones. 
Um, we are right now in Hachichojima, a little island south of Tokyo, 300 miles south of Tokyo, that advertises with the bioluminescent fungi for tourism. Can you imagine that? A place that advertises, we have five bioluminescent species of mushrooms, please come. And then you go in the botanical garden and there they have some cultivated Mycenas. I mean, amazing. And yes, the mosquitoes are out and we hardly didn't make it there because of a typhoon coming through. But you know, you turn off the light and it's just amazing. And um, they have such luminosity. Um, you know, when you, I cleaned up around there because, you know, when you do photos in the dark, you get all kinds of, uh, the cameras see all kinds of light where there is no light or, or weirdness, but um, there's only one range of color. So you want to do any color editing. No, it's not possible because you have only this tiny spectrum, which is assumed to be a byproduct of breaking down lignin uh, that these photons are released. Uh, we don't know of a um, evolutionary advantage of bioluminescent fungi. Uh, in the Mycena genus, there is, I don't know, several dozens of them and really closely related other Mycenas do not have it, some have it, and it's not that they started suddenly to dominate Mycena because, hey, we glow in the dark and we're going to attract insects and they're going to spread our spores. Doesn't seem to be the case, but what beauty. I mean, you know, just amazing. And here with a tiny bit of light and this chlorophores, um, uh, the stems do not have, don't release any photons. And there's other Mycenas where only the stems release light. And then of course we have the honey mushroom and foxfire where you sometimes only see uh, bioluminescence in the mycelium and nowhere else. So uh, I think it's still quite mysterious about the bioluminescence and fungi. Okay, now for the last tiny stretch, I'll take you back to uh, Colombia here, the Rio Claro. A uh, tropical area that is extremely rich in species, Amazonan and uh, Central um, American species meet there. And unfortunately, right behind the marble rocks is a big um, quarry turning marble into cement. And unfortunately, the biggest uh, employer locally, so um, private uh, protection area. And I'm going there always with. Uh, the lady with the head was Tatiana San Juan, who got her PhD in tropical, neotropical cordyceps. And she is an awesome taxonomist and not such a good photographer. So we worked fine together. And um, so my uh, photo of a new species of cordyceps she described made it onto the cover of Mycologia, uh, Cordyceps acridophila. Uh, which is uh, a species of a locust. And uh, the lady looking at uh, that, uh, at um, our Amazon field guide there, she's from the Kochi people, which are really interesting, very spiritual people living um, in Colombia on the Caribbean coast. And then I'm just sharing a couple cordyceps here in Bolivia. The name is from Asia, might be something else, but that's as good as we know. Um, that upper one really looks like mother goose there. Only on shield bugs and they lay on top of leaves often. So they're not in the soil or in dead wood or anything. These uh, uh, shield bug cordyceps, they often sit within a few leaves and then you see the fruiting body. You can see in different stage of decay. Uh, we ran into this cordyceps that is not described yet, which uh, grows on, this, uh, on these spider eggs. Um, I thought, oh, there must be a big insect down below because there was 15 fruiting bodies or so, and they were like four inches apart. And wow, what's that going to be? And then I ran into, what is this? And then after I washed it and cleaned it, um, there was these uh, spider eggs on the base. Another cordyceps, uh, metacordyceps. Now this should be Nigeria, um, undescribed, we found there. I was uh, with Tatiana, I was hired to help with the Netflix movie, um, Our Planet or so, you know, which just showed up last year or two years ago um, with David Attenborough. And they have like 30 seconds on, on cordyceps 
in there, which got me four weeks in the Bolivian Amazon. And, and I made sure that Tatiana is coming along too. And I shared my uh, honorarium with her because she's a much better taxonomist and knows cordyceps better than I do. And we found, um, I think, 35 species of cordyceps in the Bolivian Amazon in one area, which is um, the highest count of cordyceps in one spot, um, maybe in the new world. And then we found another one not described yet here on another set of spiders. Um, and, you know, but Tatiana got to do the description stuff. Um, that's not my forte. And we came across this awesome wasp cordyceps. And I mean, just look at, at, at you know, how the fungus here grows over the eyes and spreads. And these are the fruiting bodies, the stroma. So um, coming out of these... Uh, close to the wing attachment. And then that might be an anamorph of, of your cordyceps and birdie eye, but it could also be a parasite. But the parasites of cordyceps are still very few are described and not much is known of these parasites of parasites. Um, uh, Nigelia martialis, which is a, a quite common species on larvae as on beetles and here on the scarabaeus dung beetle. So big beetle, an inch to two inch in size, and then these, these, as I think, gorgeous fruiting bodies. But there's other people who think these things are really, I don't know, um, scary or, yeah. Anyways, um, here one of the cordyceps Tatiana described, cordyceps needles, needles for um, growing here on a um, trapdoor spider. So that's not my picture there. You see a trapdoor spider. They're related to the tarantulas and they built, they have these cocons in the ground with a very well camouflaged lid. And they just sit under that lid and wait till another big insect or a mouse comes by and then catch them. But, you know, also the catcher gets caught by the game sometimes. The hunter gets caught by the game and here the cordyceps is uh, getting the uh, this tarantula relative. Uh, Terula, um, always pointing up something in a coral style, wood decay, a whole bunch of species. Finally got a good paper with 35 tropical, neotropical species. Uh, very helpful. And um, very common, these uh, morph parachutes, Marasmius, hematocephalus, bloodhead, marasmius, translated. And they always will tell you if it has rained recently. Um, they show up when there's lots of rain and fruit from these leaves. And in the old days, everybody was just assuming, oh, they grow from the leaves, they must be digesting the leaves. But they're endophytical uh, fungi. So they have a function in the leaf, maybe they produce a toxin that keeps insects away. Maybe they help the leaf to deal better with drying out or something. And then when the leaf's falling, then the mushroom will not work for the leaf or the tree anymore, but then the mushroom or the fungus will fruit. So endophytic mushrooms is a big, big deal and, and lots of new stuff being discovered that these fungi that often grow out of leaves or sometimes out of wood, they are not just digesting the biomass, but they actually have a fungus uh, protecting and cooperating with the plant. But then once the, 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 the plant is dead, they, will, um, they can fruit. One of the most beautiful marasmus, Tageticola. in uh, Colombia, Rio Claro. Only seen it once and um, not again so far. Oh, oh, that was last year produced, or this year, a big mushroom calendar, 12 by 17, way too thick paper, um, way too fancily done. So I might do another one for this year, but um, uh, scale down the production costs. But uh, if you're interested, uh, let me know, send me an email. Um, these are six months out of there, how I put it together. And uh, anyways, um, mushrooming tours. I was lucky this year, Colombia, we still could do in March, three days after we left the country, they closed it down. Supposedly the airports are opening today again. 
uh, September 1st. But um, so who knows if we can do it in April. But if you're interested, send me an email. I won't start collecting money at this point as I usually would do. Um, we'll play it, you know, see how things develop and maybe move it into, into November. We have different places in, in Colombia according to the rainy season, where the rainy season shows. Um, so there's, it's a, such an incredible diverse country, um, top 10 in regard of diversity in the world in Colombia. So we'll work with that. And hopefully next year we can do our Bhutan trip, which as I said, would have been uh, right now, was still uh, September 1st. And, um, but we will see um, if any of that nature will work. Bhutan is very eager to have tourists. They're hurting badly not having any tourism as many tourist places are. And of course me as a travel agent, you know, luckily I can enjoy my mushrooms without traveling and without organizing these tours. But yes, um, it, uh, it sucks. But hey, um, there's other situations that are much more painful than me uh, not being able to, to offer this. I made an Amazon field guide with Larry Evans together. So if you travel, if you go somewhere uh, in the tropics, 60-70% of the species you'll find very similar in the old world tropics and about 90% you find between uh, Mexico and you know the north of Argentina and Chile so very helpful um, fold out style. Um, I made this medicinal mushrooms with Robert Rogers who is one of the foremost uh, medicinal mushroom guys who just published a book on medicinal mushrooms focusing on 21 species that have double blind studies. So everybody always, yes, medicinal mushrooms, there is no scientific evidence and efficacy and we don't have double blind studies. No, we do have double blind studies for 21 medicinal mushrooms. And he put these together and looked into the wider background of these mushrooms. Just uh, came out last week. Um, so uh, really cool um, that this is done and you know, these, uh, science fundamentalists who I think just take their skepticism too far and, and, and you know, just, yeah, we need good science, but there's a lot of studies and yes, fungophobe, uh, Anglo culture countries, um, there's not much, that much happening, though it is really uh, improving. Well, then when I go somewhere, I usually have with me my emergency whistles and my mushroom knives, um, but um, you can send me emails and uh, PayPal and so on. I will not charge you for mailing. Um, if you're interested, I uh, love my mushroom knives and emergency whistles. Then I have these uh, field guides for California and the uh, Pacific Northwest. And then, oh, key thing. So I have a couple more Zoom presentations. Um, I want to point out on September 17th, I have not uh, scheduled the times, but I will make it so possible for the East Coast as well. I will do a special on Bhutan mushrooms as a fundraising for Bhutan Network, uh, which works on rural income generation or maybe rural uh, empowerment of rural populations in Bhutan, really grassroots, down, uh, down to earth stuff. And that's the people who I worked with, um, mostly ladies I worked with on the mushrooms in, in, in Bhutan project. So that will be on September 17th. Um, send me an email and I hope uh, here that um, uh, you guys please share my email, me at mushroaming.com if you're interested and let me know. And then um, I think the Portland Society OMS, you have open access. So they have a Zoom, not limited to 100 people, but they have uh, the next size of uh, subscription. So you could uh, join that. That would be probably 10 o'clock your time, 7 p.m., I guess. Uh, well, okay, that's basically the same I did today. But Bellingham, I will do just cordyceps in Orient and Occident. And then, yeah, well, you've seen that. And then I want to thank you all so much to uh, attend. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope I didn't overload you. Probably I did, but hey, um, lots of eye candy. And thank you so much, Tom, for being insistent that this is happening. And, and, and as everywhere, all the, all the volunteers in our mycological societies uh, 
will beat fungophobia, fauna, flora, and fungi. This is the trinity, right? And the fungus gets always the short, let's call it the short end of the stick, right? And, and we all really got to work that fungus get their place in our culture. And I see there's a lot of process and uh, progress and, and everyone uh, in, in the mycological societies and elsewhere really is, uh, is helping us to make it past anglo-fungophobia that has really traumatized uh, uh, all the British informed cultures. So um, you find thousands of pictures of mine um, on mushroaming.com. So all much more, you know, hundreds of, oh, over a thousand pictures from Colombia by now, everything subtitled, uh, species as good as I can. I'm not a taxonomist, but I try my best. Um, and um, fake book, yes, you find me on fake book too, but just for fungal stuff. Um, I'm not out there to sh share my personal life um, um, with the world like that. Too much Lutheran upbringing, I guess. Anyway, so uh, thank you all so much. And um, if you still have some time for questions, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much. We probably can, uh, David, but I think the, uh, the encomiums that have rolled in on the chat room as I'm looking at the bottom of the screen probably uh, say as much as we might want to add to what would have to be Fantasia uh, revisited, I guess, if you've ever seen the Disney version of the mushrooms. <laughs> uh, I was a world tour with a, a dialogue to match. Uh, I, I don't think that's probably possible to be replicated. So our, our, we have uh, high gratitude for your taking the time to visit with us. If there are any pressing questions or if Elizabeth, you see anything in the chat room that you want to pass along and perhaps we could pursue that for uh, a little bit of time but at this point i think it would almost be anticlimactic but uh, i'll leave that to you if there's something there you want to talk with um there were, you know given that you've worked on the medicinals there were a, a couple of questions about those that i think people might be interested in um and one was that shiva who i believe is from Nepal asked if you know about the traditional medicine in Bhutan related to treating mushroom poisoning. Oh, well, that's um, very easy. According to Bhutanese ideas, which is also I encountered in the south, um, the southwest of Tibetan autonomous region in the Kongpo cultural area, um, Whenever you eat Santoxylum prickly ash, you call it on the East Coast. Whenever you eat this uh, prickly ash, uh, Santoxylum bungei, um, which is a Szechuan pepper, with your mushrooms, you cannot get poisoned. So this is really good news um, as long as you do that eating edible mushrooms. Do not try to turn toxic <laughs> mushrooms into edible mushrooms by uh, using Cetron pepper. So I'm sure Shiva uh, knows all about adventurous mushroom eaters in Nepali culture. Bhutan has a big segment of its society with a Nepali background and um, uh, I ran into some of them in Bhutan forests and when asked them, um, yeah, well, we picked this, we picked that. No, we don't really know, but that sound, that looks good. And it was like, oh, you know, yes, I have my beef with anglofungophobia, but uh, the other end of the spectrum, well, let's eat it and see what happens um, is, is not the answer. So um, there is problems each year people do die um, from eating the wrong mushrooms. I ran into one guy who said, um, yeah, you know, when I don't know what it is in Bhutan, in Bumtang, he said, and he was an old mushroom hunter, I boil it. And, you know, maybe 10 minutes parboiling and then I cook it up and then usually they're all fine. And it's like, how can you say that? And then I asked, and then he said, well, I do not eat any mushroom that has a ring which is a very smart policy because you take out the Amanitas, right? Gallerina, um, 
all kinds of mushrooms, deadly mushrooms. There's a whole bunch of them that have a little annulus. So that was a great modifier, but still um, that approach is just too freewheeling for me. And, and you know, uh, yes, on one side I quote like David Aurora who goes by his fun, profound taxonomic knowledge and says, hey, sorry, in that subgroup of Amanita, we do not have any toxic mushrooms. There is no risk eating Amanita Augusta um, because, you know, there's 70 mushrooms in that subgroup of Amanita and all of them are non-toxic. So, uh, yeah, so um, there is issues and, and, and being a fungophile culture, uh, Tibetan culture and a lot of these um, Tibetan influenced Paleo-Mongolian tribes in the Himalayas love their mushrooms and some of them are quite adventurous mushroom eaters and that can be problematic. And uh, you started off with the veiled uh, stinkhorn and yeah. someone asked a question that I'm also very curious about. So it, does the veil have a function and what part of the mushroom is it coming so out the veil, of? Um, one can see it function when the ants is climbing up that mushroom. Huh. So I would think it enables insects, non-flying insects, um, to make it up on the cap. Um, there is uh, there is some with shorter veils um, and you know DNA set that it's very closely to the ones without the veils and usually the veil is under the under the cap uh, which is covered in the gleba and the ones that are veiled have thinner stems. You, you can really see the space they take up. So when you see the thinner stems um, and then the veil tissue so I, I would think it is uh, for insects to, to climb up there. And I mean, whenever you see them, whenever there's cleba, there's insects, you know? Uh, it's just when I take my pictures sometimes, you know, then I scare them away. And, um, but uh, it's all about insects uh, moving the spores around. I did actually a whole talk about stink horns um, on, uh, PSM is our Puget Sound Mycological Society. We happen to have a meeting on Valentine's Day. Um, and so I, 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 I did uh, just a talk on stink horns with the little footnote, I might be uncomfortable if you bring minors with you, um, but it wasn't that bad, no. Uh, and then you talked about the, the Merasmius being uh -huh. Um, growing within the leaves and then fruiting. Is that true for all Marasmia species? Do you know? Oh, I, I wouldn't know and, and I, nobody would be able to say such a thing. I mean, yeah. but I mean, even big agriculture is now looking into endophytic mushrooms. Like if you have the, light, the right fungus within wheat or corn, uh, you can make it more uh, drought resistant, more heat resistant, more, uh, they might fight off fight of insects. So, I mean, Mother Nature had all kinds of tricks before there was GMO, and we usually had the time to adjust for that and not suddenly have to deal with, you know, what is this um, bacteria turingensis or so, you know, which is great to fight off certain insects, but can cause for some people trouble. And, um, you know, anyway, so um, I, I think nobody has an answer for that. And we'll hear much more about it in the future that, 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 that fungi are just in so many organisms and have been overlooked. And DNA, with DNA, we suddenly get a reading on a fungal DNA in an organism. Wait a minute, what's that doing here? This is, there's something else in there. Just like Toby, what's his family name? I forgot who discovered that there's three species usually involved in a lichen right. because of DNA, DNA readings. There was not just an ascomycete usually and the and algae or cyanobacteria, but there was a basidiomycete and microscopically it was overlooked. Um, but DNA showed there is consistently a third partner involved and spill it, to be a spill it. Um, which interestingly, his parents, he's a, his German parents and they were German um, fundamentalists, which is quite rare in Germany since they all left to the US. So the parents moved to the US so they could home educate, which you can't do in Germany. And then the guy 
what does he do? He falls in love with science and you know, even breaks iconoclastic, changes the whole perspective on Esco, or on, on Lycan. So, you know, the Lords, the way of the Lords are mysterious. <laughs> um, I'll just ask one last question from Johnny. He's asking, D have you seen a difference within South America from country to country in terms of being mushroom friendly versus mushroom hostile? Um, so I haven't been to all South American countries, but the first time, the first country I visited um, was uh, Venezuela and for doing some Buddhist studies there. And I was told there is no edible mushrooms. The only edible mushrooms you can buy in a can in the supermarket. And I heard the same line in, in Colombia. And um, uh, there is, in, in Bolivia, people would, in the, in the Andes, they would, uh, Swillus was introduced with the pine trees. So there is, there's a market for Swillus. And now actually Bolitas edulis is showing in Brazil in pine plantations, um, but it wasn't around before. Um, and there's a handful of morels in, in Chile, but Chile is working the hardest on their mushrooms, establishing them as something, as a culinary, a speciality and this um, uh, Juliana Furci I mentioned, she's working very hard on that and other people. And so I would think, and they have put uh, fungi into their law. So when you do an env environmental impact study, you have flora, fauna, and funga. And now you have to educate people to be mycologists because the law says fungi are equal with plants and animals and suddenly you need that expertise you need to teach it in school you need it for environmental impact studies and that was such a brilliant idea and that's something we all got to work on this thing that it's not just flora and fauna you know it's always animals and plants and yes of course there's bacteria and all the other stuff but let's get the fungi in there you know the three f's the trinity and, and this will really hopefully change the mindsets uh, in, in the US or uh, English speaking world, hopefully. I think that would be an adequate benediction for the night. Uh, that should do it for the evening. Uh, again, thank you, Daniel and Zachary for the wonderful presentations of Asian world of mushrooms and Mitch, Mitch of course, with your continuous uh, support of uh, the mushroom table.